Welcome back to Ask an Addiction Specialist. Happy for you to join us. I'm Bob Weathers. Odie Martinez. Very happy for you to be with us. I was just whispering to Odie right before we began that he and Austin Armstrong, who's in the studio and handling all the technical uh, components of today, they've created an introduction to our podcast e each week that, that has music. It's, it's uh, smooth jazz music. And I was thinking about it. I didn't have time to whisper it, but I, I've got a new jazz quartet that features a sax player. And while we nice. don't really want to position ourselves as being smooth jazz, we are very much in that style. So one of these days, yeah. for the introduction, we're going to have the band in here, and oh, we're going to do the introduction. Awesome. It's very much in that style. It's really cool. <laughs> it's a departure for me because I've been playing jazz. Well, I've been playing jazz for decades, but I've been playing jazz for the last several years. I've had a band. Austin's been to see them, and it's a, it's a, a acoustic jazz. It's referred to as straight-ahead jazz, and it's oftentimes when people think of jazz, they think of this jazz It's kind of bebop. It's very kind of frenetic. Mm -hmm. It has a fast tempo, and for most people, it's not that melodic, right. and it's hard to dance to. <laughs> and the new band plays a very different style. It's very much based in improvisation, which is a common mm -hmm. core with jazz, but it's uh, it's funky, and it's right. contemporary. We, we actually have some contemporary pop songs that we're playing, uh, we'll, we'll play the song and then we'll improvise off of it. It has a whole different sound. It's got electronic keyboards and stuff like that. So hold your breath. Yeah. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> okay. Anyway, welcome to everybody. It's wonderful to have you back with us. I want to give a special, um, uh, express a, a special gratitude and appreciation to last week's guest who's with us today. Angela McLeod was with us here in the studio. Angela lives up in Bellingham, Washington. And Angela, you came down, visited us last week, and shared with us wisdom from your experience about how we might regulate our nervous systems, the value of using skillful practices like Qigong practice, which is an ancient Chinese methodology for self-calming and grounding ourselves, and tying that all into uh, a recovery from addiction, and really bless you and appreciate so much you're bringing your accrued wisdom to us. So thank you, Angela. And I really highly recommend that all of you that weren't here last week, you go back and you view uh, that podcast featuring Angela. It was very, uh, uh, very educational and illuminating. And, uh, and, and it was also scratch and sniff. We actually did some exercises here. And I did it with my one good wing as best <laughs> I could. Angela has two good wings. She was able to, to show us some of the practices that can help ground our bodies in what she talked about as the window of tolerance, which is very much related to staying centered or grounded or calm in a way that is as some of our best insurance against relapse into addiction. So thank you, Angela. Angela has been one of our faithful uh, members at a distance. She's a member by proxy. She's honorary participant with us each week, and I think that you're with us today, Angela. So in the spirit of Angela's participation over, over the, the last uh, year, I want to invite you, Angela, and all other guests that are watching us today to feel free to contribute questions and comments as they come up for you. Uh, Austin is able and ready. He's at the ready, and he'll convey your questions or comments to Odie and I, and we'll do our best to respond to those in real time. So that's a bit of an introduction, and here we go. Today's topic is integral recovery practice, and your response might be, huh? huh? <laughs> it's a huh. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so I love it. let's talk a little bit about what we mean by integral recovery to start with, and then, and then we'll be underscoring the importance of practice as we move through. Integral is a technical term, but it really is synonymous with holistic. Mm. And what does holistic mean? Well, we're really talking about looking at recovery from a perspective that honors the body, the mind, and the spirit, that it's full spectrum. Uh, for those of you that have been involved in recovery in the 12-step programs, this won't be uh, new to you. Uh, the 12-step programs like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and other self-help support groups will oftentimes describe addiction as being a spiritual problem that requires a spiritual solution. Mm -hmm. So right there built in, you have the idea of spirit being at the heart of addiction. My background, as most of you know, is, as a, a, is in clinical psychology. For the last 10 years, I've been working in recovery coaching, and I'll introduce virtually every group that I lead by talking about my background mm -hmm. coming out of psychology. We'll look more at the the level of mind. We'll look at mental and emotional and relational components of addiction. Those are absolutely relevant. And as I said yesterday in a group, were I a physician, 
a psychiatrist or otherwise, I might well be talking about what goes on in the body in terms of, uh, and I do talk about that some, but that's not my front yard in terms of talking about the neurochemistry of addiction, mm. um, uh, psychopharmacology as interventions in addiction, etc. And so what we're talking about is a way of honoring all three of those perspectives and everything that kind of glues them together. That, uh, in a nutshell, is what integral recovery intends to do. Inter yeah. Integral recovery takes it one step further, which I love. Somebody talked about integral recovery as being holistic recovery with a map. Mm. And we want to talk a little bit about the map today. And by map, what we want to talk about is it's one thing to read about body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. It's another thing. How do we actually practice skills that will be germane to our sustaining recovery? Mm -hmm. And that's really the focus of our conversation today. In some ways, it's the focus of all our conversations because right. we always tie this into practical applications. Odie's here with me as my sidekick, or I as his. And we'll oftentimes talk about how we apply this material to our own lives, mm -hmm. to our own recovery, and we'll be doing that today. Um, let me give a little bit more of a backdrop to integral recovery specifically because it's a term that's, uh, that, that has a specific kind of heritage, and it's recent. I got into recovery in the last 10 years. I got into integral theory about 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. My doctoral dissertation was uh, completed in 1985, and uh, it was in meditation, it was in mindfulness, and it was in what became the roots of what later became integral psychology. And so uh, I go back to way back early with the, the, the roots of integral theory. Let me give you some idea of some current roots and kind of work backwards. I should say this, when I got into recovery, I didn't know that anybody had written about integral theory applied to recovery. Mm -hmm. So I went online and began to do some research. And here's what I found. Here's who I found. To start with, my dear friend, John Dupuis. He's got a, there's his mug, and Austin's bringing up his mug. I was just on the phone today with John. He's, he's living, he's a, he lives in two states right now. He's in Louisiana and Tomorrow morning, he's driving back to Utah. John lives in Utah and Louisiana with his wife, Pam, and their dog, Lucy, Queen Lucy. <laughs> and John's become a very dear friend of mine. And John was the first person I contacted those years ago. His book, which is the next slide, had just come out literally as I moved into my own recovery. This book is entitled Integral Recovery. And it's just what I said. It's a holistic approach to recovery. And it's definitely with a map. He provides very, uh, each chapter lays out not only information that's important for understanding addiction and recovery. And when we talk about addiction, it can be addiction to substance. It can be addiction to behavior. It doesn't matter. The same model applies. And then John includes kind of boots on the ground applications. And so I was quite taken by that. I reached out to John, and we've been fast friends ever since then. So he's really, we, we refer to each other as brother, and that's not an exaggeration. He's a brother in arms for sure. Um, so I recommend to you, if you're not familiar with uh, a holistic approach to recovery, this is, this, is, this is the source text to begin with. This came out several years ago. You can find it online, Integral Recovery by John Dupuy. Highly recommended. Actually, uh, I be this is how it went. I, I, I got the book and began reading it. It, it was it was literally just out. And uh, and I immediately went online. I've been a I've been interested in getting information online since then. And I was working at a university and I went online and I gave a review of the book and I held up the book. The <laughs> next photograph is of a colleague of John Dupuy. This is Guy Duplessis. John lives in Utah and Louisiana. Guy lives in Cape Town, South Africa. Guy reached out to me immediately on viewing my video review of this book and said, Bob, I think we need to talk. <laughs> and so it was Guy that connected me with John. That's how it went. So I became friends, uh, first of all, with Guy in South Africa. We continue to be very close friends. He's somebody I deeply respect in the field of recovery. He connected me with John. And in fact, all three of us converged on Utah. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 a year later, a guy flew in from South Africa, I flew in from Southern California, and John uh, and Pam hosted us in, uh, in Utah, and that was the beginning of the friendship at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, since that time, Guy Duplessis has been prolific, and I'm going to talk about three books that Guy has written that are all related to integral recovery, and, and, and then you will have the four kind of key textbooks so far in integral recovery, and I'm working on the fifth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Okay. We'll hold off on my talking further about that until it's right here in my hot little hands, okay? <laughs> but I'm working on a fifth book right now that would be another addition to this integral recovery literature. It's very much based on what we've created here. It's nice. very much based on what we've very created nice. here. So Guy Duplessis, first of all, collaborated with Dr. Stanley Block, who's a psychiatrist who lives up in the Washington State area up near Angela. He lives in, I want to say Port Townsend, Washington, up near Seattle. Guy and Stan collaborated on a book, and that's the next uh, picture here. That's a mind-body work uh, book for addiction. They asked for me to write the foreword for that book, and so I wrote the foreword to the book that Guy wrote with Stan Block, and this is a very practical, literally step-by-step -step approach to applying mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy to addiction recovery. Mm. And I highly recommend this book to you. It's also available. All of these books are available online, Amazon, and so on. You can order them, have them in a day or two at this point. Um, and so that was my introduction to Guy's writings. Guy, at the same time, was writing another book that came out. And it's very close in title to the first book by John Dupuy. This book is called An Integral Guide to Recovery, 12 Steps and Beyond. And this is Guy's first book in, uh, of his own in integral recovery. Highly recommend this book. Guy and I are both in recovery, and Guy talks in a way that is hard to read without crying about his own experience in recovery and the loss of friends and family to addiction. So he talks in a way that's really heartrending. It's not just intellectual stuff. And the subtitle, 12 Steps and Beyond, is that Guy and John and I have great respect for the 12-step traditions, and we also bring other, um, I bring psychology to bear, for example, some of which is not really talked about in the rooms, and there's a, the idea is not to detract from 12 steps, it's really meant to supplement 12 steps. Guy has the same uh, orientation in his book, uh, Integral Guide to Recovery, and then just this last uh, year, uh, 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 Guy finished a second, uh, his second own book, and it's called An Integral Foundation for Addiction Treatment. I've written reviews of both of these books. They're actually in the books, as well as on Amazon. And you can read my reviews if you want to, if you look these books online at, at Amazon, to get an idea of what the books are about. The first book is more practical. The second book is more theoretical. The second book is really meant more for clinicians. Don't want to scare anybody off, but it's more technical. The first book is readily accessible. So there you have the four books that have been established in integral recovery, specific to recovery. Now, the godfather of integral theory is the next slide, and this is Ken Wilber. Ken Wilber is about five years older than I, and I first met Ken Wilber back in the early 1980s. When he was 23, he published his first book, which makes me sick because <laughs> it was so brilliant. <laughs> and I read it right when it came out. I just happened to be in graduate school right when he wrote his first book. Wow. And it was called Spectrum of Consciousness. And he's written dozens of books since then. And he's an incredibly prolific, uh, incredibly bright. I. It's hard to... He's a philosopher, among other things. Uh, he writes about theory that, it, that is holistic in nature, and then people will apply it to business, to education, to medicine, to psychology, and in the case of John, Guy, and myself, to recovery. And so Ken Wilber is the one that we bow to in terms of having kind of laid the groundwork. Ken Wilber's uh, book that came out uh, about 10 or 15 years ago that was I don't know, it's his 15th or 15th or 20th book that really pertains to what we're talking about today. It was simply called Integral Life Practice, and that's the next slide. Integral Life Practice. That was an edited volume, uh, and I've gotten to know his co-author, Marco Morelli, as well, uh, uh, and there were a couple of other co-authors. That book has had a tremendously strong impact on John Dupuy, on Guy Duplessis, and on myself. And we're really talking about taking integral life practice and applying that to recovery. And so that's where we are today. How's that for an introduction? That was great. Any questions, Your Honor? No. Okay, okay. It just gives you a little bit of a backdrop. <laughs> There's a tradition here. So when we talk about integral recovery practice, it really is has a specific kind of intellectual root, research root, and application um, uh, applications. And if you have an interest in our podcast here and have an interest in following this uh, more yourself, I highly recommend every text that I've that I've mentioned to you. Mm. <clears throat> Rather than talking theoretically, what I'd like to do now is to move into application of a, a holistic approach to recovery and tie it into practice. And I want to start with a question. The question is this, have you ever been told 
happens all the time in recovery, but it's not just in recovery. Have you ever been told that you need to love yourself? Hmm. You need to learn to love yourself, Austin. <laughs> Bob, he's doing it. He's doing it. <laughs> he holds his head to his heart. <laughs> okay, we're done for the day. <laughs> okay. Uh, most of us have heard that, you know, uh, if, it's, if it's because we walk around um, uh, unhappy, uh, maybe we all rock around self-sabotaging. Mm -hmm. Some of us have ended up in relationships, I'm just talking theoretically here, we've ended up in relationships that have been problematic, and it makes sense that we might learn to love ourselves before we get into a relationship, mm -hmm. and so on it goes. This is one of those uh, uh, very commonly used uh, injunctions or, or uh sources of advice uh, in, in recovery, is that people are encouraged to hold off on getting into further relationships only because they can oftentimes be stressful at best, and at worst, you can get into a relationship where it actually leads you to relapse. Mm -hmm. And so the, the advice is typically, can you, can you just hold off for a second and learn to love yourself? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been told that? Yeah. I've been told that. By my brother. Okay, yeah. It was kind of, uh, not weird, but it was, I don't even know the, the context of what she used it, yeah. but I think he was just kind of giving me brotherly advice. Okay. And he yeah. was just like, you gotta love yourself. But the way that he talks, he's a New Yorker, so he's like, you gotta love yourself, yo. And yo. <laughs> Can I ask you a question, yo? Uh -huh. <laughs> I've, I've been told that same thing, and, and I want to ask you, uh, ask you, and then I'll, I'll confess for me too. Uh -huh. When your brother told you that, did you have any idea how to do that? I had no idea. Mm. I, that, I thank you for saying that. I didn't yeah. want to lead you. I didn't want to lead no, the question. Yeah. People have told me that <laughs> over the years. It's not that it's bad advice, but it's partial. It's like, yeah. that's a good direction, but could you give me a little bit more clue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what what it would mean to love myself? And All I want right. to talk a little bit about that today. Not that there's some magic bullet to loving ourselves, but it's commonly given as advice. I've actually had it given to me sometimes as scolding. Mm. You need to love yourself, yo. <laughs> You know, yeah. so there's lots of the tone makes a difference, right. but it can sometimes be confusing in terms of it's not that it's untrue, but it's like a platitude. It's like, how do I mm -hmm. apply that? That sounds very complicated right. to me. Very desirable, yeah. but I'm not sure how to get from point A to point B. That yeah, yeah, exactly. And when he said that, I just, again, like you mentioned, I didn't know what to, to do about it. It made sense. I've heard it before Yeah, from other like, yeah. celebrities yeah. and authors and successful people and I, I was thinking at that moment in time when he did tell me like maybe I need to do that I just need to figure out how to do that yeah yeah and yeah so yeah. the route that I took was like personal development so I read a lot of personal development good books for you. Good and for whatnot you. Good, for, but, good, good, good for you that's um, a, that's that's a start for sure right but I don't know if that led to that you know? I think it's a start. You know, I want to acknowledge, as you were talking uh, synchronistically, up on the screen came, I believe it's probably from Angela, and if it is, thank you very much, Angela, is that Angela <laughs> says she loves the map aspect of integral theory. I'm going to tie this into what mm -hmm. uh, you just said, Odie. She says, uh, she says, I love the map aspect. You remember how I said it's holistic recovery or holistic theory with a map? And, it, and she says, it makes the holistic aspect of integral recovery easier to implement because there is a map. Mm -hmm. And she says, thanks for bringing this topic to the show. You're yeah. welcome. And thank you for your compliment about my doing a good job of explaining it. That's, that, that matters a lot to me. I hope to do that. Thank you. Is that one of the things that Ken Wilber, you remember his, his face just a minute ago that I showed in his book, Integral Life Practice, one of the things that Ken Wilber says, ties it right into what he said, he says, reading good material mm -hmm. is psychoactive. Mm -hmm. And so intellectual understanding is psychoactive, which is, it, it means it changes us. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of a psychoactive drug, you take it and it, it changes something inside of you. Well, this is reading or information, taking right. an educational input is psychoactive. And I think that's half the battle sometimes. It's just mm -hmm. providing vocabulary, okay. providing information. I think it's helpful. You notice I say it's half the battle. Right. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not sufficient just to have information. Mm -hmm. but it's a good place to start to have a foundation, as I understand it. So I'm all for that. I'm all right. for that. In fact, our show a lot here, our podcast here, is about some combination of providing good information, which is, like we say, half the battle. Mm -hmm. It's psychoactive. And the other is then applying it. 
Okay. There's a blank because if it just stays as information, then it can have head knowledge, but it, there's no there's no uh, there's no knowing how to uh, uh, apply this to my life. I like the distinction that some people make is that there's information and then there's understanding. Mm -hmm. Information I can take in; it kind of goes in one ear and out the other in some ways. But understanding means that I stand under something. I stand under the information, which is to say, it informs the way I live my life. Okay. And so we're aiming for understanding. We had a podcast a couple, three weeks ago with Tomas Rudy out of um, Switzerland, and he talked about wisdom. You can talk about wisdom yeah. the same way. Is It's possible to be really smart and not very wise. Mm -hmm. And so what we're aiming for is wisdom or understanding mm -hmm. where, we, where we apply this. Okay. okay, well, let's, you ready for some, you ready for a little pocket of information? Yo? Yes, okay. yo. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> If, if, back to this question for a second. You need to love yourself. One of the thoughts I have about this, I've been pondering this for a number of years and in a concentrated way for the last week since our last podcast with Angela, is that it's possible to experience my not loving myself. I had to invent a word. I do this from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, unlove. I don't know that that's a word, but it is now. And it's got a dash in there. It's a little hyphen. Mm -hmm. Unlove. And we've talked about shame as being one manifestation of not loving myself, mm. of judging myself. Unlove slash shame. I can experience that temporarily as a state. Like, you know, you might be embarrassed in a moment and it feels lousy, but it passes in five minutes or an hour. Mm. It just is a, it's a, it's a discrete state. That's not so much what we've been talking about in our podcast here over the last year. We've been talking more about this, the next slide, which is unlove or shame as a stage. And by stage, what we're saying is something more permanent. Mm -hmm. If you can think of a state as being a blip like that, okay. a stage is more of a plateau. It's more stable. It's like a stable uh, way of being. Okay. And it's possible for me to stay in that unlove or that shame. Well, I have to use the word state, that state of mind where it becomes a stage of mind. That's really, that's another word that we haven't, a phrase we haven't used before. And so what we're talking about is how do we impact Odie's loving himself more, Bob's loving myself more, because for a moment I might love myself. If you compliment me, I can go <sighs> like that, okay. But it might be just like <sighs> blow by like a cloud. Mm -hmm. But what would it be like to take that in and for that to land inside of a stable trait for me. Mm. It's another way to talk about a stage of right. loving myself, of compassion for myself. It's not a temporary state. It's a stable trait. What would it be like to lock, lock that in? Do you have a thought about that? I was just thinking that I feel like, I feel like I, I go through that sometimes as well. Like, when somebody gives a certain compliment, mm -hmm. just in general, mm -hmm. generally speaking, mm -hmm. that there's certain things that are said that are compliments that will either be a state or will be a stage. Yeah, that's like, right. Okay. Yeah. They'll say something complimentary, like, well, yeah, I already knew that. But yeah, not yeah. like in a... Does it really make a big difference? Right. Yeah. But there'll be something like, oh, I didn't know that about yeah. myself. Hmm. And then you, I think about it yeah. and then I say, well, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Yeah. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. I think I misunderstood you. Let's go back and see if I well, got what this. What do you think at first? Oh, let me just go with what you're saying okay. is that if, if I compliment you on something that you know about yourself, mm -hmm. if I say that you're bright right. and you know that you're bright, it lands in a stable trait. You know that. And right. so you can take that in. Okay. Whereas if I say you're bright and you don't feel like you're bright, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a, it's got a, 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 a shelf life of a nanosecond. It's like, it's, you don't really agree with that? Right. It's like you said, it's like a bloop. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So good. It, it good. registers, but then it's like, well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's not what I know myself as. That's perfect. That's you know? perfect. That's perfect. That's how I understood that's what perfect. Yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. Got different thoughts about that. And every thought I have has a big word associated with it. I'm trying to think of talking without using big words. Okay. The big words I've learned were in psychology, and they're problematic. Okay, here we go. We're, gonna, we're just going to go for it. There's a distinction in psychology between something that's egocentonic, mm -hmm. and syntonic is spelt S-Y-N-T-O-N-I-C, and it's got a hyphen, egocentonic. Ego is the Latin word for I. It's just, it's yourself, right. myself. So something that's egocentonic means that it, it's in sync 
with my sense of self. Okay. So if I compliment you, or you, so if I compliment you on being bright, and that's in sync with your sense of yourself. It's, it's egocentric. Like, it's, oh, man, you are such a quick <laughs> learner. See, there you are. You're so bright. Thank you. I already knew that. <laughs> it went in. Okay. 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 So that's egocentric. And that's a good thing. It lands and it stays. Okay. Whereas let's say that it's ego, the, the opposite of egocentric is ego dystonic, and it's D Y S, same T O N I C. So it's ego slash D Y S T O N I C. And the idea of that is that ego is self. Dystonic means it's not in sync with your sense of mm. self. So I say you're so bright, and it doesn't mesh with, 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 with your experience of yourself. And so there's a couple of images that come to mind. It'll either go through you like a sieve, mm -hmm. it won't stay, or it'll go and it'll bounce off like Teflon. Mm. Is it go bam, it'll just ricochet off. In either case, it doesn't land inside. Does that make sense? Yeah. So is it, I guess uh, you lost me a little bit, so. Well, what is it about egocentric and egodystonic that lost you? <laughs> I thought you were bright. No, yeah. <laughs> So the egocentric. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you're my bad. I'm <laughs> supposed to be a good teacher here. I'm not doing a very good job. Egocentric is that it's in sync. So yes, it'll yeah. be sync with what my belief. Yeah, and so it stays. It stays. Dystonic is that it'll. It, it doesn't stick. It isn't. It doesn't stick. And so, so it's a temporary state. I can give you a compliment, and you might have a little blip, but it doesn't really land and stay. Right. Well, I guess you lost me when you said, you'll say it, but it'll go through me. Yeah, I should have. Okay, let's or, drop the sieve image, like going through a strainer or a sieve. Let's just yeah. stick with Teflon. Does that make sense? Okay. It bounces off of you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just stick with the bouncing off of. Okay, okay. okay. You know, not everything works. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. Okay. So... How do we move? This is the million dollar question tying into Bob and Odie need to love themselves. How do we move from, from this sense of you can compliment me or you can actually love me as a brother, let's say. You can love me and it might not go in. It might bounce off. How do we move from it bouncing off to my actually receiving your caring? Think about mm -hmm. this with the parent and their okay. child. Think about this with a loved one, like a sibling. Think about this with a partner, your wife or my wife. How do we get to a place where we move from a temporary state of love mm -hmm. and then we go back to our steady state, which is of unlove? How do we move from that state of unlove to a, a solid trait, let's say, of being loved? Mm. Does this make sense? Yeah. Am I sketching it out kind of, sort of? Yeah, no. Okay. No, kind of, sort of, you're sketching it out. I'm doing good. Yeah. This, this, this one matters a lot in recovery because when I talk to people in recovery, you have a situation of a vicious cycle, and the vicious cycle is this. I already started off, many of the people that I work with in recovery, and this would include myself, started off with a compromised sense of self-love or mm -hmm. self-compassion. Okay. Already it's dicey. Mm -hmm. And then you know this from your own experience, Odie, and we've talked about it, and I certainly know it from mine, and we've talked about mine too, is that when you move into addiction, that typically only adds, makes the matters worse. Mm -hmm. I already felt bad about myself, didn't feel hot about myself, and now that I'm addicted to substance or behaviors, that makes me some version of a loser or a failure mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And if I'm already vulnerable to that, it can just amplify that, make it exponentially worse. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so this, this question we're talking about is how do you reverse this? How do you turn around? This came up just recently this morning. Uh, I led a group this morning. At 8 o'clock in the morning, I love the group this morning, and there was a gentleman in the group who talked about a term that's used in the 12-step programs is the wreckage of the past. And it would be mm -hmm. the things, the damage that we've done by virtue of our addictions, particularly to those that love us most. Mm -hmm. We've damaged trust. They've been disappointed. They felt betrayed, et cetera, oftentimes. And there are other damages as well. Sometimes it's legal problems in, in, in addiction to substance and so on, et cetera. And this individual was talking about he's working right now on finding a way to not be fixated on the damage that he's done, but trying to focus in a positive way on the progress he's making right now. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Mm, yeah. How do you turn this ship around? From feeling bad and judgment towards you, bad about yourself, judgment towards yourself, towards being able to move forward in a positive way. And we're not talking about making excuses or ignoring. We're talking about changing your life. Mm -hmm. How do you change your life when you're drugged down by the millstone of what you've done? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah.
perfect sense. The next slide points to an author who addresses this. This is Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell is, a, is an author, uh, a columnist for New Yorker magazine. He's written a couple of books. I just, just am finishing Tipping Point right now. Do you know that book, Austin? You probably heard of it. Yes, the tip, Tipping Point. I won't talk about the tipping point, but I'll put it out of there as a teaser. The, the book that, that, that I want to talk about is another book of his called Outliers. And in this book, Malcolm Gladwell, some of you will be familiar with this. I recommend both books. They're very readable and really interesting. He's brilliant. In Outliers, he answers the question, what does it take to turn the ship around? Mm -hmm. His term for that is, what does it take to develop mastery in anything? Mm. And I have to, you have to prepare yourself for this, okay? Are you ready? Are you? Are no, you, are, okay. okay. <laughs> he, he says it takes 10,000 hours mm. to develop mastery of anything. I've heard of the 10,000-hour yeah. 10, hour rule. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did he yeah, yeah. coin that? Or? Mm -hmm, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. Uh, it's, out, it's out in the culture at this point. And so that's depressing. <laughs> 10,000 hours a is <laughs> a long time. <laughs> Somebody's written up a quote here. I'll come back to that in a second. I'll come back to that in a second. He breaks it down in a way that's helpful. And you think about your work. Austin, you think about your work. Bob, I'll think about my work. Is that what that means is 10,000 hours is 40 hours a week for five hours. If you work for 40 hours a week for five years. Did I say that? Okay, I didn't say it right. 40 hours a week for five years. Let's get it right. Okay. Speak English. That's 10,000 hours. And you go, that's a long time, but we're, we all work for, for five years. <laughs> this is a shameless plug for Austin Armstrong. He's been at this for longer than five years and more than 40 hours a week. So we have a digital marketing master in our midst. <laughs> I got to tell you guys, and it's fun to think about this. It's fun to think about this. There's a handful of things that I've done. I've taught for well over 10,000 hours, yeah. whether I'll leave it to other people or whether I'm a master or not, but I've taught more than that. I've done therapy for tens of thousands of hours. Mm. And so I've done that a lot over, over 40 years. You can kind of do the math on that. But there's some interesting things. I've drummed for 55 years. I've drummed for more than 10,000 hours. Oh. So I better be good. <laughs> <laughs> God help us. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also, earlier in my life, in an earlier incarnation, I played more than 10,000 hours of tennis. I played a lot of competitive tennis when I was young. And so I was a decent a tennis player for sure. That's not possible anymore. Why is that? Because I played 10,000 hours of tennis. <laughs> My shoulders bear the brunt of that. I just drummed last night and I'm hanging on to drumming for as long as I can. My body has borne the uh, consequences of tens of thousands of hours mm -hmm. of drumming. Uh, you guys are going to appreciate this maybe. It, it came up to me. Somebody just asked me this question uh, at, at a, a staff meeting yesterday morning. I started meditating in the summer of 1980, and I calculated since 1980, because we're coming up on 40 years later, next year I will have meditated for 10,000 hours. Mm. <laughs> I haven't meditated for 40 hours a week, but I've meditated for 40 years. Mm. And so if you do the math on this, I've med I will have meditated in the ballpark of 10,000 hours. So doggone it, I'd better be good at that too. And so on it goes, okay. Yeah. If you live long enough, you will have done several things for 10,000 hours, whatever it is, digital marketing. That's a good thing to have done. <laughs> and so the point of this is, is that practice makes a big difference and that, that it's possible. It's possible to change our lives. Mm -hmm. It's possible to change things inside for ourselves. And I don't want to get people depressed here, but what I want to suggest is if Odie and Bob start practicing some things, and we're going to do an exercise here in just a moment, that will help build in a sense of loving ourselves. Mm -hmm. If I start now and do that today and then tomorrow and just keep doing that, one day in five years, I'll wake up and I can have done that or not. Why not start that? Mm -hmm. Austin, you started at some point with your passion for digital marketing. And you just put one foot in front of the other, and here you wake up however many years later mm -hmm. with tremendous expertise, which speaks for itself. Yeah. You've done that, you've done that. And you could have done something else, but that's what you've done. And so why not pick some things that we care about and just start plugging away mm -hmm. at them? Yeah. I'll tell you guys a story that I told here on a podcast about a year ago, is that 50 years ago, this fall, I started high school. I started 
I started high school in 1969, and in fall of 1969, I started, I was, I grew up in Central California. I don't know why, but I decided I wanted to study German. Mm -hmm. There's no one in Central California that speaks German. That would have included me. That's why I was taking German. But everybody where I grew up took Spanish because there was a lot of Spanish speaking. There was no German, and I've always been a little bit of a nonconformist, so I'm going to study German. And so I studied German. That's one of the central gifts of my life, not because I'm fluent in German, I'm not, but because I met a man who was my German teacher for four years in high school who became a father figure to me. And we've talked about Mr. Hayes here before. Yeah. One day I'll bring in a picture of Mr. Hayes. And on the wall in the language lab of my German uh, uh, class for the next four years was a poster. And that poster said this, Übung macht den Meister. Odie is going to translate for us. I'll do it. Okay, yeah, well, I'll do it. You said it last time. Yeah, so. we did talk about it. Übung macht den No, here we go, here we go. Master. It literally translates as practice, which is übung. Macht means makes. Dane means the. Meister means just what it sounds like. Master. Master. A lot of English comes from uh, German. Ever heard the word kindergarten? No, yeah, I haven't. No. <laughs> Ever heard the word Volkswagen? <laughs> they sound differently, but at any rate, there's a lot of roots. We're, they're both Germanic languages, or they're sometimes mm -hmm. called Teutonic languages. English and German are both Teutonic languages. So practice makes the master is what we've picked up in our own language, and we call practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. So back to Malcolm Gladwell. What, is it, what does it take to develop mastery? He's using the term master. It takes 10,000 hours. And I'd like us to use that, uh, hold that number lightly. Just It's meant just as inspiration of if I dedicate myself to something, I'll wake up one day and be master, mm -hmm. uh, a master of it. Mm -hmm. I just plug it with that with a little bit of grace. So what would it become, what would it take to become a master in the sense, or a meister in the way that we're talking about it? of caring more for ourselves than we do. Back to that question. Yeah. You just need to love yourself, yo. <laughs> okay. What would it what would it take to do that? Yo. <laughs> what would it take, brother? What would it take? And what we're suggesting is it would take practice. Yeah. And I don't want to put this in terms of numbers because we're talking about something that's mm -hmm. spiritual mm -hmm. uh, in, in the deepest way. But we can use 10,000 as an analogy or as an image of what it would take would be dedicated practice. Mm -hmm. And to break that down a little bit, what would it take for me to move from loving others in place of blaming them and judging them and then turn that towards myself? What would it take for me to... Mm -hmm. Embrace myself with compassion and 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 with literally with grace, as opposed to the kind of self judgment or shame that we've talked so much about here. I want to tell a couple of uh, mention a couple of stories uh, real quickly here, uh, and I've, I have spoken of these in various ways over time. We're talking about training a new reflex. Uh, uh, brain science refers to it as developing new neural pathways, mm -hmm. new neural pathways in your brain and my brain. Uh, if you can imagine building new neural pathways, one friend of mine talked about psychotherapy as simply building brain. What would it take to build new neural pathways, back to your brother, of loving ourselves, yo? <laughs> okay. He's going to really hate this podcast, right? Okay. I'm going to suggest a couple of practices. We're going to do one of them today, and we've done them before, but this is a new context for it. This is all in the context of our talking about integral recovery practice. It's about practicing something. We've done forgiveness practice here any number of times, which is a way of forgiving others rather than judging them and finding forgiveness or compassion for ourselves rather than staying with the judgment of ourselves that actually paralyzes us. And we're actually going to do that exercise again next week. But today I want to pick a second practice that we've done a handful of times here, and it's gratitude practice. Mm -hmm. And it's gratitude not only for the gifts that we've been given, but gratitude that we're the ones that, have been that we've received these gifts. And it's going to be stopping for a moment and just expressing gratitude for, for what what, what we do have in our lives. It's in us to pick things that we don't have. Mm -hmm. It's easy to find fault, you know, like at the end of your day, how was your day, honey? Oh, and then you'll think of the one thing, oh, is that podcast with Bob where he kept <laughs> using the word yo? <laughs> you know? yeah. We'll pick the one exception <laughs> rather than looking at the wonderfulness of being with Bob Weathers talking about yo. <laughs> okay. No, rather than all the good things, right? Mm -hmm. we, we tend to do that. Yeah, yeah we tend absolutely. to do that. And so gratitude practice is a way of focusing on things that are, are uh, positive and useful. I want to pause for just a second. There's a couple of comments. Let me read them here. Oh, 
Okay. First thing, this quote from Bruce Lee, the immortal karate, judo, martial arts expert is fantastic. And I've never heard this. And I'd really like Austin to please send this to me. This is awesome. Fear not the man, might have been Austin that wrote this. Fear not the man who practiced. Did you write that? Yeah. You did. I should have known. <laughs> We're getting to know each other, Austin, Mr. Armstrong. This is great. This is from Austin. Please send this to me. Austin says, fear not the man, who, uh, no, Austin channeling Bruce Lee says, fear not the man who practices 10,000 kicks one time. Ah, oh, this is so great. But the man who practices one kick 10,000 times. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's great. I've heard that. Man, you could, I have never heard that. You, that's awesome. That's awesome. And then the more, yeah. better person to come from, but Bruce Lee. Yeah. Because yeah. I heard that he kicked kicked harder than a mule, so yeah, you probably yeah, practice one yeah, kick 10,000 times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite drummer of all time was Tony Williams. He died about 20 years ago, tragically very young, after a, an operation went sideways. And after he died, there were all kinds of honoring of him in jazz. Uh, he was the drummer for Miles Davis, is how he came to fame, mm -hmm. and he was young. He was 17 when he started playing with Miles. He was just like this phenomenon. And when he died, you know what they said? They said he was the Bruce Lee of drumming. <laughs> that gives you a sense of right. uh, uh, Bruce Lee's stature, even to people that don't do that stuff, as they oh. reference Bruce Lee. Yeah. He says, practice one kick 10,000 times. That's brilliant. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Appreciate that very much. And right underneath that's a question. Do you have any suggestions for what to pick for daily practices that would be holistic? Hang on. <laughs> We're going to move into that just in just a moment here. We're going to do about a five-minute meditation in about five minutes, and it will be a suggestion here. And, uh, and I've, already, I've already kind of tipped my hand. Another practice that we'll be doing next week, because it's very much the spirit of our doing this, we'll be, we'll be modeling forgiveness practice here. And there's a couple of other practices that I'd like to bring in over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Austin has, has been encouraging me to bring in practices because we can record them and then post them online. Today we'll be doing gratitude practice, next week forgiveness practice, and a couple more that will follow over the next few weeks. All four of these are examples of practice that... that our body, mind, spirit, and intention. While I'm thinking of it, just out of complete honor and respect, Angela, last week, your presentation on Jigong would be an example of a, of a practice that if done daily, certainly is holistic in intention mm -hmm. and would change your life uh, to practice that daily. It's changing your life. I know, Angela, because you, you shared it with us last week. So um, uh, that's a great question. It's a very practical question, a really important one. And we'll be doing that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me suggest real quickly is that I began the practice we're going to do right now, gratitude practice. I began this just in the last few years. I'd say it's been about four or five years, and it came out of my reading um, in psychology. There's a psychologist uh, up at University of California, Davis, Robert Emmons. You can look him up online, E-M-M-O-N-S. And he is the international expert on the relationship between gratitude on the one hand mm -hmm. and reducing stress on the other. And so he's looking at gratitude from a psychological perspective. There's tons of literature, for example, in the spiritual literatures, including of Christianity, mm -hmm. around gratitude and thanksgiving. So you, you won't be at a lack to find examples of gratitude uh, articles and even books on gratitude in the spiritual literature or the spiritual traditions of the world. Um, and what Robert Emmons has done is he's a bridge from that to psychology and I also want to say to medical applications because he looks at actually the application of gratitude to reducing stress and affecting things like your heart resiliency, reducing ulcers, other stress-related illnesses and so on. There's been a fair bit of research that's been done as a sideline to this at Stanford University too, looking at the application of what we're going to be doing. I began, as, as happens a lot of my life, I'll begin reading something. I'll begin, it's back to what you're saying. Yeah. I'll begin reading something and then I'll get curious about it and I'll think, I think I need to try this. Mm -hmm. And so I've been building this into my own practice for the last... It's been the last few years. I don't really know how long it's been. Three to five years, let's say, that I practiced this more mornings than not. I didn't this morning, because why? I was up late last night drumming, and I got up too late this morning to do it and had an early morning group. And so I forgive myself for that, but most mornings I'm up practicing what we're going to do here. And, the, and I think about this, because, because of my background in psychology, I think about it very practically, is that practicing gratitude really serves me body, 
in terms of calming my body, mind and emotion in terms of getting me to focus on positive uh, kind of affirmations for the day, mm -hmm. and definitely spiritual because you'll see with the meditation we're going to do is that there's a spiritual quality throughout the meditation, a position of gratitude or thanksgiving in one's life, for, as far as I'm concerned, is, a, is, a, is by definition a spiritual position mm -hmm. in life. So we'll be talking about that in a second. What I want to say before we do the, the uh, meditation is this is that if I started off, and I did start off 10 years ago, very early in recovery, if I started off, I want to say back to your brother, and I won't use the word yo, <laughs> but I just did. Okay, <laughs> is that I started off, I think, 90% uh, of the time, probably extremely vulnerable to shame. Okay. I would be like the Teflon that we talked about earlier. Right. You brought me a compliment, Bob, you're this, Bob, you're that. And I would probably look at you politely and go, thank you, Odie. And the fact is, is that if you knew me, you'd know it didn't go in. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was those years ago. And there's been steady practice. A number of the practices that we'll be introducing the, these next few weeks, which are integral recovery-oriented practices, I've been practicing most every day. <clears throat> I haven't done the math on that yet because I don't know how to do the 10,000 thing, but it's adding up. <laughs> You know, you do enough gratitude practices, <laughs> you do enough forgiveness practice, and pretty soon you've accumulated a few thousand of these puppies. Yeah. And all I know is this this is the case for me. I can still be vulnerable to shame. Mm -hmm. And shame is just shorthand for not loving myself, mm -hmm. not being compassionate for myself. Well, you just saw it. I yeah. said I got up this morning and I didn't meditate. I didn't I didn't I didn't have the time to do that and I was too exhausted and I loved drumming last night, so don't make any apologies for that. But in my telling you that I didn't pull out a whip. Did you see a whip? No. I didn't pull out a whip and start beating myself. It's like, that's how that went today. Mm -hmm. I'm very committed to meditation practice. I'm even more deeply committed to compassion for mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And that position has come out of this practice. And mm -hmm. so I, as we've talked about before, and it's in my notes, is that I believe I've moved from a position of 90% of lack of compassion, mm -hmm. which I'm sad to say was probably the case, right. to the case for right now. I still have vulnerability, but it's like 10% vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You can catch me on a bad day. If I'm tired or I've had a couple flub ups in a row and you come in and you criticize me and it can go in and you see a dark cloud going over my face. But most of the time I'm resilient to that mm -hmm. and I credit that to integral recovery practice. Mm -hmm. okay. I credit that to this practice. I can imagine a dark cloud over your face. You what? I couldn't imagine a dark cloud over your face. Just don't, you know, I used to tell this to students when we <laughs> study abnormal psychology. We'd be studying different things like depression and anxiety or even um, thought disorders like psychosis and so on. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, Dr. Bob, I've never experienced that. And I, I just say, well, let's just do an experiment. Austin and Odie and Bob are going to lock the door and we're not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> okay. Okay, we get up tomorrow. We're kind of crusty, but we kind of make it through the day. We're looking forward to sleeping, but we don't get to sleep tomorrow night either. Okay. And then we don't get to do that the next night. Well, within a two or three nights and certainly within a week, all, all three of us are not going to be doing real well. <laughs> there will be black clouds. Okay. There will be black clouds. <laughs> and all I'm suggesting is that stress, including lack of sleep, um, um, upset in terms of what's mm -hmm. going on in our environment and so on, soon enough the black clouds come in and none of us are immune to that. It's kind of you to say that. I'm going to receive that. <laughs> I'm going to receive that. And the fact is, is we're all human. And yeah. so given enough stress, too much work, not enough sleep, not enough play, not enough connection, mm -hmm. and soon enough the black clouds come in. And so what we're talking about is creating a zone. I'm going to uh, refer to what Angela presented last week. We're talking about creating a, a window of tolerance and expanding that. Mm -hmm. and I think of it in terms of creating an oasis for ourselves and doing that if we can as regularly as possible. So let's do that. No more talk. Let's do that going to talk us through a five-minute meditation, and then we'll unpack it, uh, and uh, we'll be done for today, and then we'll kind of link this to next week's presentation, which will be on forgiveness practice. This is gratitude practice, and it's kind of the format that I've developed for myself over the last few years. I hope that you find some parts helpful, and I don't need for you to do any of it exactly like I suggest. Just riff off of what I do in a way that's useful for yourself. So mm -hmm. let's start. Let's start by this. Let's just take a deep breath in. I recommend you close your eyes. Uh, and if not, just lower your head just to reduce distraction. So let's close our eyes and take a deep breath in. And breathe out. When you're ready, follow your own rhythm. Breathe in again when you're ready. Deeply. All the way in, all the way down. Let your diaphragm naturally rise as you breathe in. And watch it fall or feel it fall as you breathe out. 
Do that again. Breathing in, rising. Breathing out, gently falling. Okay, we've done this before, but I want you to join me in beginner's mind today. Let's apply it today as a, a way of increasing our window of tolerance, as Angela talked about, or as uh, creating a, a little sanctuary, a little safe space for ourselves today. So if you're in recovery, like I am and like Odie is, and we've talked about that, and, you, and you've been sober today, you've not engaged in and you're that addictive behavior, if it's a substance or behavior, just to notice that and express gratitude for a day of sustained recovery. If you've experienced challenges health-wise and you've got a reprieve from that and you have some aspects of physical health, maybe all of your body, maybe parts of your being, where you can be thankful for the physical health you have, then to pause for a moment and, and experience that uh, appreciation, that gratitude. If you've had an opportunity to exercise your body yesterday or today or have plans for later today or tomorrow, gratitude for physical exercise. Our bodies appreciate that. If you're going for a walk, going to the gym, being thankful for that. If you have enough food to eat, and particularly if it's nutritious food, gratitude for that. Our bodies respond so uh, gratefully to our eating well. The same with sleep. So many of the people I work with are early in recovery from addiction to substance and their sleep is all upside down. And so they're grateful if they get a couple of hours or three hours in a row of sleep because it's so disturbed. So gratitude for any sleep you've had, including any improvement in sleep, just gratitude for the rest that our bodies so desperately need. If you have ways like what Angela was talking about last week of practicing self-calming, whether it's with exercises like Qigong or yoga or meditation, whatever you do to relax that's non-addictive, it's non-destructive, it's a way to calm your body that doesn't, doesn't have a hangover or withdrawal associated with it. Gratitude for that. Gratitude for a way to calm your body, your mind, your soul like what we're doing right now. <laughs> and then a handful, maybe a half a dozen other gratitudes. I'll move through these relatively quickly. You can come back and take more time with them. Gratitude for a roof over your, over your head, if you have that. Gratitude for food on the table. Gratitude for warmth in the shelter where you live, where you are. It's so not a given. I think about sometimes gratitude if you live in a place where there's not bombing going on. There's so many places we could be on the planet that are in active warfare conditions right now. Just gratitude for that. Physical security, not to be taken for granted. And just with our physical environment, so with our emotional environment, Gratitude for any relationship you have with a loved one, a parent, a partner, a friend, with whom you feel safe. Gratitude for safety. I was talking earlier with somebody about drama in their relationships, and we were both exploring what does it feel like to be in a relationship that's not dramatic in that negative sense, but rather provides stability, is reliable, that you can count on. Gratitude for that. Related to that, gratitude for relationships where we feel close and feel loved. 
for those that I work with that are in recovery, it's gratitude for, for remembering people in our lives that haven't given up on us, that have sustained hope for us. You can feel it the way that they look at us in their eyes. Gratitude for people that believe in you, that you trust, that you can be vulnerable and real with. Gratitude for gifts that you've been given. This gets right at this business of loving ourselves. I think all of this does, but gratitude for strengths that you have, strengths in your body, strengths in your mind, strengths in your emotional life, strengths in your ability to relate to others with love, compassion, and related to that, strengths in your spirit or in your spirituality. Gratitude for these gifts that you've been given. Th these gifts that make you who you are. And then finally, gratitude for any opportunities that you have to live, uh, live a life of meaning, of purpose. Gratitude to be able to live out why you think you were born to be on this planet, you know, to live with value. And even if that's not clear to you, it, it might be that it's never been clear or that it's in transition. If you feel like you're moving in the direction of building the foundational blocks towards, uh, uh, to, towards a life of purpose and of meaning, then gratitude for that direction that you're headed. That's something to be grateful for. And then finally, just gratitude for this moment, this oasis that we've created for five minutes here, actually for an hour together with Odie and Austin and Bob. Gratitude just to have a moment just to um, care for ourselves, <laughs> caring enough about ourselves to give us this hour together. Okay, when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Owing to time, I'm just going to uh, quickly move on. I want to ask you to consider something on your own, is reflect on this exercise later, if you would, on your own. You're welcome to write me. I'll give you my email address. Uh, what, what, what did you find uh, interesting or useful? What did you notice in the practice? We take so many of these things for granted, mm -hmm. and, and unless we build this in, it's easy to miss it. So we're talking about Thanksgiving more often than once a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's great in, in November, but how about more often than that? Mm -hmm. Imagine. Uh, and also uh, reflect on what was challenging. There may be some of these things that just like, it's just, it's hard to, it's, it's like the Teflon. It's hard to take it in or it's hard to recognize something to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. I, I covered a dozen different things to be grateful for. Some of those may not be real for you and it's fine to just be honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but which ones were challenging for you? I want to leave you with this, uh, speaking of challenge, I want to leave you with this challenge or admonition. Why not practice what we just did? Why not practice your own version of that this week? Why not practice that? Not for 10,000 hours, but how about five minutes a day for the next seven days? What would that be like? Be interesting to see. I have a picture of that poster. Übrigen macht den Meister. It's pretty close to what was on the wall. It's not exactly it, but it's pretty close to it. We're talking about practice makes perfect or practice makes the master. And the hope here, the hope here is that, that we can begin, you know, we talked about creating new neural pathways. And we've talked before about habits. Yeah. We're talking about retraining our, our, our minds and our hearts. Uh, and as we practice this, we actually change our brains. Mm -hmm. And so that would be yeah. the answer to your yo, brother, <laughs> is that if I practice loving myself, yeah. brother, if I practice loving myself, it, may, it might not happen immediately. Hopefully it happened this side of 10,000 hours, but if we, mm -hmm. if we practice this, psychology and actually brain science suggests that if we practice something like this, uh, 
uh, Angela mentioned this, I believe, the idea is that what fires together wires together. And so if I continue, the brain fires these electrical impulses. If I continue to fire, in, in this context, gratitude, yeah. eventually the brain will begin to wire that way. And mm -hmm. so you actually create structural change in the brain. And the bottom line is it becomes a habit that, that uh, grows in our lives and can change our lives. So uh, do you have any comments, questions as we wrap up? Uh, I think you covered pretty much everything. One of the comments or the questions that came up is, um, well, what's the answer to practicing mm -hmm. self-love? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and that's practice. You put it into practice, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then the other question was, well, how long does it take for mm -hmm. it to turn around? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, we kind of covered that as well, that there's not really a number to it. You know, mm -hmm. just I think everybody kind of has their own their own pace of how the scientist the scientist go. in me just thought of something as you're talking about this if we were to measure you and me mm. let's pick both of us let's pick me when i was 90 percent of unlove what i was calling okay. unlove and if i was to practice this for a week or a month mm -hmm. or two months it'd be very interesting to track that across time to see what the curve is mm. because for me it wasn't like a blast of insight it was like gradually building new habits to where it be, that curve begins, it's a learning curve, it begins to grow. Right. And it's, it's curious to me, at what point would it be detectable? Mm. I can tell you now, five or 10 years later, it's totally detectable. Mm. The difference between 90% and 10% is humongous yeah. and it's tangible and people that know me see that. People that, you haven't known me for all those 10 years, but mm -hmm. people have and, and there's a resilience inside that I only take partial credit only because I've been practicing this, mm -hmm. but all the credit as far as I'm concerned goes to God mm -hmm. or however you want to understand that because it feels like grace that has transformed me and I've just shown up. Yeah. I've just shown up. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you could track it across, my sense of it is you could track it across time and Odie and Bob and your brother Yo would begin, <laughs> they would make gradual progress and so you tap in a month later, a year later, five years later, 10 years later, and you're going to get this kind of growth that would show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, somebody wrote here, we'll finish with this. I like how you encourage us to riff off your gratitude practice. Yours is great, but it's nice to know we can also create our own. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate it. you've been very present today. You know, it really is that, isn't it? It's like last week you presented on Qigong practice, and today we're talking about gratitude practice. Next week, forgiveness practice. It is about practice, and it's about your signature. It's about Odie's mm -hmm. version or Bob's version or Austin's version or Angela's version. Each one of us has to find our own thing. I, I, uh, I, one, of my one of the psychologists I appreciate so much, James Hillman, a Jungian analyst, had a lot of impact on me in my years of practice and so on. He says he felt like the central enemy to spiritual growth is literal. And what he meant by that is taking something that somebody says and having to apply it just like they said it to ourselves. And the mm -hmm. fact is, each one of us is unique in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it stands to reason that your application will be an improvisation or a modification right. of what Angela suggested and of what Bob, yeah. Bob suggested. So I totally agree. We're big on riffing here. That's great. Right. Next week, we will riff on managing our resentments and we'll be focusing on forgiveness practice. I hope you'll come back. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, you can write me at drbobweathers.com about how this went for you today, pro and con, and I'd like to respond to you. Love for you to come back and then would uh, really encourage you to invite your friends, okay? We'll be back next week, and uh, it'll be at least Odie and me here. I'm not sure if Austin's going to be here or not because we're working out the scheduling for next week. He looks puzzled. He's, he's nodding. I don't know. <laughs> Some of us will be. I'll be here. I'll be here for sure. We'll figure it out. Come back and join us next week. Thank you all for uh, being with us. And uh, practice, practice, practice. Good luck this week with your own riffing. Take care.